Hello, hello. Um, welcome everyone. This is another session of Global Tech Talks. Today, the subject of the topic is implementing a design system. Disappear. <laughs> connection we are reconnecting now so the today is about the implementation of a design system um, a quick question like who of you are working in design system okay so most of these will be like familiar to you so well they welcome thank you to everyone for being here like we know that today is super cold and it's rainy and everything, so you're welcome. And the program. So first, the, a little bit intro by me, that I'm Francisco, I'm a staff product designer. Then we will have the first talk, uh, Elio, building a design system and shared components library from scratch that Victor will be presenting. Then the second talk is, you can have too much of a good well, the next one <laughs> by Juani, which is an engineer manager, and at the end, uh, networking and some beers. So a uh, little bit about Globo. The vision of Globo is give everyone AC access to anything in their city. And we're in 25 countries. That's more than 15, well, 1,500 cities. and. 130k monthly active partners so restaurants and all that for doing that we are three 13 clusters so areas then 109 teams reported in those clusters and more than 600 engineers so going a little bit more in context about the design systems and what is global in general so for most of the people, Globo is the customer app, right? Like the one that you use to order food or whatever. But there is other clusters or other areas, and these are some of them, like the courier, the partners, the admin, and so on and so on. And each of those requires like the web, the Android, the iOS, all these applications. For some cases, each of them has their own design system. And on top of that, there are other teams or other areas that are across all these clusters so in conclusion this is like a mind-blowing thing and it's sometimes very complex and we're working on this but luckily for for you today we have two great speakers that will explain a little bit about how we are solving this in global so i pass the micro to victor Okay, sorry, today we have technical difficulties. I also was kicked out of a Zoom call. Give me a second to reconnect, sorry. Okay, here we go, hope you can see it. So hello everyone, my name is Victor. I'm a software engineer here in Glovo. I'm working in customer experience team. And today I wanna to talk with you about how we build the design system and components library from scratch. My talk is gonna be more focused on the technical side, how we solve this as engineers, how we integrate this with the designs and stuff like this. And then Juani will speak a bit more in detail uh, from the business perspective and what it means for the company about the future and next steps of this. 
uh, after all of this, we're gonna host a super quick Q&A session. So if you have any questions, keep them in mind and ask them after the slides. So let's unwrap it first. First of all, what is Hero in uh, simple words? Hero is the name of the global design system that we have for customer Android, iOS, and web applications. So it's cross-platform as you can see. It's being built by us, customer core experience team for use by both UX designers and engineers. Uh, you might ask, what is a design system for us? Uh, for us, design system is a set of components that share the same style. And if we combine these components, we can create a co cohesive a product that looks properly. We cannot call a design system a set of different components that have completely different fonts or colors, because if you combine them, as you might guess, it's gonna look very bad. Uh, so what are the main parts of the Hero design system? Again, from the technical side. We can split it into two big areas. One is the design, all of this in Figma. Uh, I don't know how many of you are here from the design world, uh, but you're probably familiar with this tool. So in this example, you can see the buttons. And uh, in these files of the Figma, we actually host all these components that we later reuse. So if a designer is built a new screen, for example, with the buttons, with the forms, they're gonna use exactly these components from this screen uh, and then when we change these components in the first place, it's gonna impact all other screens, exactly the same way we have in the code for our components that we later built out of this. Uh, here we have a Maven package for Android, XC framework for iOS, and an NPM package for web. So we transform basically Figma into code in a way. And this is exactly what I'm gonna be talking about here. How is it working? It sounds complex. Well, it kind of is. So let's let's unwrap this part as well. How we organize this design system? There is two big areas. The first one is design tokens. And I wanna take a closer look at, at them here. Uh, so it's very basic things that we can define with the numbers and strings and things like this. So one of them is Z indexes is the last one. It's mostly used for web. It's just a way to define which thing goes on top of which one. Then we have spacings. This one doesn't need much explanation. It's just pixels. Then we have typography and fonts. It's things like titles, body text, button text, so on and so forth. Then we have primitive colors. It's just a hex value of any color that we have. And then as you can notice, we have colors, colors. The difference between these two is that we need to support dark mode. And then color is a pair of two primitive colors. So for example, uh, black and white will represent a background color. We can call it primary background, and then in the light mode is gonna be white, and in the dark mode is gonna be black. And then we have a UI components. I'm not gonna focus too much of them right now, but we're gonna take a closer look later, I promise. Uh, but this is the list of the components as they are in a few days ago. I made these screenshots. This is a, an ever-changing project. Every time we get more components, we refactor the existing ones. So this may not be up to date even today. And uh, a little hint of what we're gonna talk later, as you can see, apart from web, iOS, and Android platforms, you can see a column called YAML. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you what is this exactly, but just keep in mind that for many components, we have something called YAML. So keep this in mind and let's keep going. Uh, before going to technical into these YAMLs and things, let's reiterate what kind of problems we're trying to solve with this. So one of the big ones, very obvious ones, is to avoid reinventing the wheel. Uh, as was mentioned, we have many clusters, many teams, many projects. So developers were implementing the same UI over and over again. And even the designers were not sharing all the resources they have at times. So we ended up with buttons that look very similar. They serve the same purpose, but they have a little bit different border radius or a different shade of the color. Then uh, we have applications for Android, web and iOS, and they look very similar at times, almost identical but they share no code base, uh, they share literally nothing. And every time we implement something, we do it from scratch. And if there is a change, we need to do it independently on each platform. Uh, all of this, most of these problems come from the next point, which is discoverability. Even if we imagine that I'm a good engineer who wants to reuse whatever we have, and I work with a great designer who wants to also reuse whatever we have, if there is no way to discover what we actually have at this moment, we may spend too many time looking for it, find nothing, and again, implement something very similar to what we have, but not exactly what we need. And, and the last point, as I already mentioned, is the dark mode. 
uh, implementing dark mode without design system stuff, and it's probably going to end badly. <laughs> so this was another strong reason to do the design system. And yeah, now we can finally talk about more technical stuff. How does it work under the hood? So it all starts with the, those designs that I mentioned, Figma 5. And then uh, we turn them into YAML definitions. YAML is just a markdown language. It's just a way to describe something in a way that is easy to read by a program. So we basically transform different properties of these design components into something our code can read. So we put things like background color, spacing, size, all of these things into organized way uh, for each variant of each component. So if we have like 12 buttons, that means we're gonna have 12 YAML files for each button. And then what we do, we feed these files into our generators. The generators is just a mono repo project. We wrote it with TypeScript uh, that parses these files. And then uh, we define how this component should look like in the end. And we produce the codes as, as we spoke before for iOS, for Android, and for web using this data. Uh, this is an example of one of this file. Uh, I don't know if you can see it well, but base concept is that this file describes a prime button. It's the purple one on the right. And it mentions things like uh, padding, left padding, medium, height, 48 pixels, shadow, uh, true text color, button text, so on and so forth. Uh, then we have specific things for platforms. At the bottom, you can see web. So here we define things that are only making sense for web. In this case, it's a hover state. This is when you put your cursor on top of the button, it changes the color. This concept only as of now exists for web. So we put it here. And yeah, it's not really important how these files look like. On top of this, uh, we are trying to optimize this because as a proof of concept, it worked very well, but it, it's not gonna scale well if you have to edit these files every time you change something in the design. Uh, so what we're working on right now is the plugin for Figma, because Figma has a free uh, REST API. And then we are gonna run the generators in the background once in every day, for example. And then we can just fill up these files with this data directly from Figma. So any change we need to do, it's not gonna involve any code at all. So let's quickly talk about benefits this architecture brings to us. First is the obvious one is the cross-platform support. Uh, basically having one definition allows us to change everything on every platform with ease. Again, if we, for, for example, for licensing reasons, we need to change the font to a different one. We do it in one place. We propagate this change to all the platforms uh, that are using Helio. It should be pretty easy and doesn't require much coding. Configurable architecture allows also to change the system. For example, if uh, we have some special project, special partnership with one of our partners where we want to take one specific page of our application and color it, for example, in red for McDonald's or in green for Mercadona, we just take what we have, all the components we have, and we change the branding. We put their font, we change the colors to the ones that they like, and it's done. We run the generator, it's done. We can already use it. As, as the same way, it also allows to iterate more quickly over design, as I mentioned with the example of changing the font. You change it in one place, run the generators, and it's done for all the platforms. All of this uh, is very important to keep this collaborative uh, because however good your core experience or whatever you call it, the team is, it's impossible to have one team to maintain all of this uh, with new requirements, with the new features, business, and stuff like this. It's impossible to keep it up to date. So it's very important to make it friendly for contributions from outside of the team or work group or whoever is responsible, which brings us to the next topic, the documentation. Here, <clears throat> I wanted to focus a bit more on this aspect. How did we solve the documentation issue? And this, this is demo time. So for documentation, we created a website. Basically, we generate this website whenever there is a change in this YAML definitions that I mentioned. And all the documentation here is based on them. So it actually represents what you're going to find in the end uh, package for developer. This website itself is built using Helio 2. So it has all these features like the dark mode out of box. And it has a documentation for every components that we have for every platform. And we tried to make it as nice as possible for people to actually make, make them want to use it. 
so we can see the preview of the components and light modes, uh, lights, dark. You can play around, you can put some text in the life editor and you can see right away how it reflects. Uh, you have code examples, instructions, how to integrate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, another important part of this, uh, of this website is the search feature. We made the search, full text search for the whole website, but not only for the text, uh, but also for the elements. For example, if I type Prime, uh, which is our branding of Lova, you can see live previews of each icon and uh, things like colors and so on. So it makes it super easy for developers to use it, to find whatever they need right away. Uh, and yeah, here we have uh, the track of all the icons we have, all the components. We also have some foundations like uh, design guidelines. Sorry, you cannot see them now, but we have like basic principles, accessibility and so on. This is all in development. It's not final, it's missing many content, uh, but at least we have the tooling. Speaking of tooling, we also tried to create something fun. And one of the tools uh, we made was the IntelliSense for Visual Studio Code. Uh, I see some of your engineers here. Uh, this is the tool just allows you to have all the hints for Helio right away in your code editor. So you don't even need to open this website. You can see all the colors, all the spacings right there. It's gonna, it's gonna paste them properly. Uh, so yeah. Once again, I want to reiterate what are the things that we learned from all this experience. One of the more important ones is to invest into design system if you didn't do it yet, as early as possible. Because if you do, don't do it soon enough, you're going to end up with uh, many different teams, clusters, trying to do their own design system, which is not so bad in itself. But then once you try to unify this, it's going to be a big problem. And the more you wait, the tougher it becomes. Another part, as I mentioned, is make it ready for contributions and provide the great documentation. So it's not only your team forever working on the system. Uh, and one other thing was, well, TypeScript, it worked well for us. Uh, doesn't mean it's gonna work well for you. It really depends on the tech stack and what kind of engineers you have. But for us, it was a great tool. Uh, and the learning curve was very easy for iOS and for Android engineers, not even mentioning web. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it, all I have to say for you today. And thank you very much. One second, please. Okay, okay, okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. One minute, I'm having some issues with Zoom, but it's gonna be fixed soon. Okay, I think we got it now. 
All right. So the title of this talk, let's go back for a second, is you can have too much of a good thing. So we're going to start with something that is probably comes to mind, uh, which is Netflix, right? I mean, Netflix in moderation is fine. You can binge watch a, a series or two, I don't know. But if you spend the whole Saturday and it's sunny outside and you're just there like eating nachos and watching Netflix, not an ideal situation, right? So I invite you to think about things that you can have too much of it and, and too much of a good thing can be a bad thing or not. We're gonna see about that. So another example is uh, classic, right? Is ice cream. You can have a group of it, but if you have the whole tray, maybe too much. Or not, because there are some recent studies that say that you have a second stomach for desserts. At least that is my case. I don't know if it's yours. Uh, but I can always have an extra scoop of ice cream. So um, obviously, we're not here about to talk about ice cream. Uh, we're talking about design systems today. So how does this work? Uh, if we have too many design systems, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do we know if it is a good thing or a bad thing? Who knows? We're here to, to see that. So um, this is not a so technical talk like Victor just did. So if you're an engineer, maybe I, I don't want to dis disappoint you. This is more of a personal story, more uh, dramatic, more tele telenovela-like, and it's a personal one. So for this, I need you folks to go back and, and try to be on my shoes like last year, okay? So the story begins on last summer. Uh, it's, it's the summer, it's Barcelona, it's super cool. You know, you have the beach, people are, you know, tourism, you have the human castles, I think it's called Castellet, right? Um, you have Sagrada Familia, of course, everything is nice. People are having fun, you're an engineer, you're just new to the city, and life is good. And I can prove that, I have an image here of myself. This is, uh, <laughs> there is Lucas here in the, in the audience as well. So anyway, here we are calling the website that we just saw on the previous talk. Uh, we did a hackathon and we tried to scramble some ideas and we started doing this on, around July. So there is me, I'm having fun. This is why I'm looking so uh, focused on my computer. But, uh, well, and what I'm being tasked right now, or at, at that moment, was to build a design system for uh, the customer app. So the customer app is the one that everybody knows. It's the one that you order, uh, use for ordering pizza or ice cream or whatever you want. Um, it's just the tip of the iceberg like we're gonna see later on. Um, but it's the one that everybody knows, right? So we build the design system. Again, life is good. People are using it. We even have a really cool logo one of the designers did. Um, but that's when the, the story takes a turn, right? Um, so we're having, one of the days we're having an all hands meeting with everybody in the engineering in particular. And um, everything is going fine. I'm just there in the audience like you guys are right now watching some people talk. Um, at some point I received this uh, message, it's in Spanish, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory from my, at the time, boss. This is time boss, <laughs> this is Gisela. And she's telling me, did you know that contact has its own design system? And the next phrase is, this cannot be like, like that, super dramatic. And this is my face uh, at the moment saying, okay, my job is to build a design system, telling me, there are other folks that have a design system. What's going on here? Um, this is not good, obviously. So this is, um, remember, I, I only had like some months in the company back then. I knew the obvious, which was my application, the customer one. And I kind of know new ones that some other people were using, right? Like um, the couriers ones and the partners one, which is the people that is delivering food or something else or the people, the restaurants, or maybe media market, you know, these companies that sell stuff through, through Global. But then it goes deeper. The iceberg goes deeper. Things that are not so well known, but they are still there and they're necessary for, you know, business reasons. Things like, for example, the admin or the tools that we use for controlling how everything is running on the operations. Uh, the contact team that was mentioned before by Francisco. Um, and there are other stuff like marketing or even content, the things that you see written maybe on marketing or, or media or anything else really. Um, and this is a picture of us having fun writing Helio up until this moment. So um, obviously we're, my team is 
fully made of engineers. And I'm an engineer myself, although lately I'm more manager than engineer. Um, so, but my mindset is the same, right? So I turned to my team, which is some of them are here present. And our, my personal point of view on this was pretty immediate. And it was like the classic, right? I'm an engineer, so I have to be right. I know how to solve this. It's fine. We have a lot of, you know, design systems, but okay, it's a technical problem, right? This is what we thought at the time. Uh, we can solve it somehow. So the first thing that we did was, was trying to survey which other design systems we had at the company uh, at that moment. And we found out that there were five of them, at least that we know so far, but maybe there is another one. You should check under your seat. Maybe there's a surprise design system. Uh, but there's five, at least that we know of, right? So there is Helio, that's ours. And then there was the contact one, uh, which is the one that my boss was messaging me, like freaking out. Uh, Reef, that is the one that's been used for uh, couriers applications, the people that is delivering stuff. And CAP, which is for partners, and the admin panel, which is for, well, you know, admin panel, controlling the operations. So we did a lot of research. I'm not gonna bore you with all of this because it will be too many slides. So we did documents, we did RFCs, we did comparison tables. Uh, I personally, I'm guilty of some of these uh, architecture diagrams that are not very nice and also very wrong. Um, but it looked nice at the time it was okay, fine. I mean, makes sense. So the plan was, uh, well, first off, Key, and key findings that we had over this analysis, right? So the first thing that we learned is that there was a distribution of design systems. We at least had five of them that we knew of. They were in different platforms. Some of these design systems were running on Android, iOS, and web. Some of them were only running in mobile, Android and iOS. Some of them were only running on web. Um, well, that's pretty much it, right? Uh, and also, um, each one, of these design systems was being managed by a different team. So maybe they didn't know knew about each other, uh, which was led to another different situation, more organizational ones, that it was a very disbalanced situation. Some of these design systems were uh, full of engineers like mine, Helio, and then there were other design systems that was probably full of designers like Francisco's teams. So they have really good designers, a lot of them, and not so many engineers to actually code this, and then there was the other, the other edge of this world. Too many engineers coding whatever they want, but nobody really to put them in check, which it was what was going on, right? So, oh yes, there are three extra things. Um, so some of these design systems were for very specific purposes. For example, the contact one that we just saw was only for uh, managing the interactions between the people that were probably complaining about late order, or that just needed some sort of assistance. And some others were more general usage, right? For example, Elio, uh, that helped you to build the whole application if you want, or most of it. Some of these design systems have different levels of maturity. Some of them were very big and had lots of components and either their own website. Uh, some of them only had like maybe a GitHub prep and that's it, because they were just much smaller. So the same applies for the scope of them, right? It's more or less the same same thing. Some of them were uh, libraries and some other were just part of the applications. So this leads us to the first approach, which is the one size fits all approach. And I think that the, the image is pretty self-explanatory, right? We have all these systems happily living in isolation. And then we say, okay, all of them need to pass through the same loop, right? So there's this one solution Everybody is, um, is gonna be included as part of the most mature design system, which is early on this moment. Um, and that's it, you know, you have to adapt because we were here first and now it's your job to adapt. So this is how it looked like. Um, engineering wise, it makes sense. I mean, I don't wanna take like the credit for this because there was some really good work in terms of uh, Elio being you know, very well coded, very well organized in the repository. But at the end of the day, this was the, the idea, just you know, adapt or, or die, really. Um, and the benefits of this were that uh, it will allow us to have a faster time to market because that way, you, know, you don't have to go things to uh, Components are much more tested because you reuse them. And of course, there is less cost, obvious reasons, because you don't have to go, to go twice. 
but um, here is when we have like the big problem. Uh, there was this sensation feeling, you know, that you know you're missing something. It's like on the movie Home Alone, when they're just happily traveling. I think it's to Florida or something, and they just forget the kid. Well, it's more or less what happened to us because, like a month and a half after he started the document, uh, somebody from the company, which uh, sadly is a very high-ranking person, one of the VPs points out something like this. Uh, the UX requirements of an app when you're running up a staircase with your motorcycle helmet are quite different from when your user is lying on their couch or sitting in their office making an order. So, I mean, it was pretty obvious, right? And she, he essentially destroyed the whole document in one, one sentence and he was right. Um, oh. So this is my face at the time, uh, like, yeah, make, makes sense, right? So if you think about it, um, well, what's going on here, that, that same rationale, that expl explanation is what led, led to the different design system to appear in the first place. It's not that everybody was just working in isolation because they didn't want to talk to each other. It's that there was an underlying need there. It's like if we're here in the room and there is suddenly there is no room, there's no doors, sorry. Somebody is going to carve a hole into the, into the wall because there is a need. Somebody, you're gonna find a way of solving it. So this is what all of these teams were doing. Uh, they were trying to solve their own issues. They just didn't know that other teams have similar issues. So this led to the, we can solve this, but this is the take two. And here is when we call design. <laughs> this time we are not so uh, proud engineers anymore. And we call Francisco's team and he with some, a lot of other people really, uh, they step in and say, okay, okay. I mean, he, when he's thinking, he does something like this, you know, like he stops for a minute and he's thinking very seriously. And he's like, okay, I need to analyze this. And this is more or less his expression at the time. Uh, so the first thing that we do if we go and take a look at how other companies are solving a similar situation, right? So we take a look at Spotify, Shopify, Skyscanner, uh, Atlassian, Adobe, IBM, and Google. Some of the solutions that we find are good. Some of the solutions that we find are okay. And in the case of a certain company over there, uh, it was really, really bad. Uh, but at least we learned from that. Um, so I don't know. So we use all of this information to go ahead and start doing a lot of analysis, but this time it was uh, design-led. So what these folks did was um, they got together, which was already challenging by itself. A lot of people involved with very different, um, very different styles. Um, they started comparing all the differences that they had. So if you take a look here, you can see that it says Reef and it says Helio, and it has all the different colors that they have. So all of the different shades of green uh, from one design system and the other. And what they did, which was pretty smart, uh, was to try to a common ground of similar colors. If you're a user, you don't really care if this uh, your green or this is your green or the other one. I mean, they look pretty similar to the eye. I know that designers are gonna say no because the luminosity and the hue, I don't know. Um, but uh, I know that we have these conversations in the past, but in many cases, uh, they look similar. Um, so they get to this common ground. And I did a huge analysis of how they look like when they're on the back, on dark backgrounds or light back, backgrounds, ah, sorry, or legibility issues, accessibility in general. Uh, so it was a really, really good job. They also took a look at how it works with icons and they, Interestingly, they found a lot of duplicates. If you take a look at this, you're gonna see that at some point, we had five different ways of using a, a user icon. Or Prime, which is one of the business lines of the company, in this example has six variations. Some of them almost exactly the same, but almost not the same. You can even go a step farther and you can take a look at this uh, tiny motorcycle. And you can see that it's not the same. Uh, they have just differences on the, on the wheels and things of the like. So what this means is that everything is very inconsistent. People are just using different icons and the applications maybe have different icons on the same package that gets distributed. 
uh, obviously this, this brings a lot of issues that are completely necessary, especially uh, maintaining this. Uh, they always also took the, the opportunity to improve this. So they designed some sort of layering system to create uh, new icons, of course, not an expert in design, but it's pretty neat. And they also took this opportunity to revise the rhythm, which is the different spacings, you may call it, or something of the like. So they analyzed how the different design systems were used in the different rhythms for their own uh, styles. And they also uh, got to get to the common ground here as well. The same applies for radius. And of course, let's not forget about typography. Um, the different applications were used in different ways of handling typography. So it's also another thing that we need to align. So the key findings of this second integration that this time was mostly led by design. So building one design system for a company that has a multi-sided business, essentially you have very different users, it's, it's a challenge, right? So let's, if you think about, I don't know, some other application, some other company that maybe the kind of experience that it gives you changes because of the platform that you're using. For example, uh, I don't know, let's say Spotify, maybe the experience is the same. It's different on the platform, but you're wanting to list, you wanna listen to music, right? But it changes a lot when you look at it from the perspective of the different users that you have. Maybe the music producers or the uh, songwriters, I don't know, anybody who is involved in the, in the music industry. And this is when it gets tricky. And actually, we, I had to say that we do a lot of inspiration from Spotify from the way that we're handling uh, things right now. Okay, so one of the first findings is that we define that we have very different experiences depending on where you're running your application, where your design system is running. So in Helio, for the customer application, the one that you may have on your phone, it has to be you know, separated from the, from the competition. So it has to be more playful. It has to invite you to use it. It had to deliver a memorable plan. So I don't know if you like bubbles or not, but you're gonna remember about the bubbles from Glow. This is the point. But this is not the reality for the people that is using this for, for work, right? I don't know if you ever tried to be a courier and deliver for Globo, but this is a very different experience. Uh, you don't care if it has bubbles, you don't care if it's green, uh, sorry, uh, if it is uh, yellow or you don't care about all of these details. You only care about it being um, usable on the go, which is what it was being referred before, like you know, running through the staircase with your helmet on. It's rainy, you have your gloves because it's cold, you're on a motorbike and you need to mark like a, that the lover, an order has been delivered. You don't care about bubbles, you don't care about anything of that. And that's, that's okay. And the last case is about the, about the partners. So for partners, it has to be even more professional. This is the people that is using the application as it were like a, like a spreadsheet. Uh, they just wanna see a lot of roads, a lot of orders. They wanna be moving fast. This is money, time is money for them. This is operations. So it has to move on a different piece. Again, they don't care about, uh, about bubbles. They don't care about big buttons that like we may care for people that is using this on the go. They care about compact information that is ready, that is, is you know, very professional-like. You can see here a practical example of this. So a small button more rounded for the, for the end users, a big button that you can use with your gloves or something of the like uh, on, for couriers, and a more you know, square one, more professional for the, for the partners. And something cool here is that you can see actually how they were using different shades of green, which is bad. This is not what we wanted. Uh, and this is the kind of things that you can actually, you know, bring together. So it doesn't make sense to have three different shades of green, but it does make sense to have different shapes for the buttons. So this was our, our key learning here. And when you think about it, it gets much, much complex than that. If you remember about the iceberg that I was pointing out before, you may think, okay, so we have free applications, that's it. It's not like that because your design system is also gonna be replicated in things that are related with advertisement, in things that are related with the digital ads that you may see somewhere or the, on the mobile play stores, um, or even physical stuff. When you take a look at the back that people are using, right when you leave the office, for sure you're gonna see one, you're gonna see this uh, uh, yellow box. It also applies there. Um, also for graphical resources or the apps in general. So it's super complex 
And it's not just like, hey, we just have different hexa values. It's not like that. It's much more, much more deep. So some key findings of this second iteration, which was way more valuable than the first one. So the first one is that it has to be centered on the journey of the user, right? Uh, this is like the, the key importance of it. It doesn't matter if it looks good just because it looks good. It needs to look functional for the people that are expecting something from the application or the advertisement or whatever you're using. And it's not just digital. Uh, like I was saying, this could be physical things as well, like a leaflet that you get on your way out here from the office. Or I think that there is even a motorcycle uh, in the entrance. Um, so it has to be included on your design system. And you need to bring everyone on board with this. Also, this one is doesn't have a dedicated slide, but I think it's important, which is about uh, self pissed What I was mentioning before about having a different distribution of engineers or designs, the designers working on different teams, this needs to be accounted for because some things will move at a different speed than others. And you cannot just say, okay, it's fine. My team is moving faster. I don't care about anybody else. Uh, this is not how it works. Then branding is king. There are some things that you cannot change. Just it doesn't matter if you like some other shade of green. If uh, there is a green in the branding of your company, in this case there is, you have to use that one. Uh, look at the chairs, look at everything is, is yellow. You have to use that yellow. It's not something that you can change. There are some things that just they're just written in stone. And the other the only people that can change that is for a very long process, very thoughtful from marketing wise. It's not even design, it's not even engineering. You cannot make that change. And lastly, and I think this is important, is um, you need to adapt to the context. It's okay if the design system doesn't support some very specific use cases. Um, this should be the exception, of course, you cannot abuse this. But a, a good example of this is that if you were to use um, the yellow color as is uh, on the branding, on the marketing materials that you have on, on the physical side, and you put that on the background of the application, it will burn your retina probably because it's just too bright. So you, in some cases, you just need to adapt to it and, and, and be very context aware of the situation in which you're using your design system. Exceptions are fine, not if you have too many exceptions, but you cannot expect to cover every single thing and say, okay, there is a Figma file, you have to use it or you cannot do it. Exceptions will happen. So um, summarizing. This led to another approach, which is the one DAs, uh, one design system to guide them all. So it's not something that's gonna fit everyone, but it's something that can guide people that are implementing their design stuff, uh, the UIs, the marketing material, physical stuff in general. And our approach was um, divide the design systems in levels first. So you're gonna have high level system, high level design systems with rules and you're gonna have local level design systems with end solutions. End solutions could be code or could be like a Figma value, a hexa value or something that you, know, you use. Um, but then the high levels will only have the rules. We'll see that about that in a minute. Tokens and components are born on their local systems and they will get promoted to higher level rules as they gain adoption or it just makes sense. It's fine if some of them never make it past their local level. This is when I was talking about exceptions. If it's something that only affects your team, your specific application or marketing material, whatever, then it's fine. Don't overuse it, but it doesn't have to be something that gets extrapolated to the rest of the company. Other things will make sense to be moved to a global state. So um, how does it look like more over you like? So everything starts with the global brand. So like I was mentioning, we have only three colors that we cannot change, which is the yellow, uh, global yellow color, the global green color, and the global, I would say, grayish uh, that we use in some other material. This is fundamental, you cannot change it. And then uh, you can also have uh, in the middle stages, shared foundations, which are probably, we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, all the colors that you can use, but maybe they are not only for marketing purposes, but maybe you need some sort of blue, maybe some, you need some sort of red. It's not part of your branding, but it's still something that you need. So that's gonna be on the, on the shared foundations or uh, on, on that level. 
Then you can also have shared components, which are functions that are more complex, you know, maybe a button, uh, maybe an input for text, something that's not just a token, not just like a, a color or a, or, or a size, uh, something more complex. And at the end of it, you're gonna have your local systems, which in our example will be Helio or will be Reef or will be any other of the design systems that we have uh, that only makes sense in a certain context, in a certain application, marketing material or whatever you're using. So um, here on the other graph is explained more in detail, but it's essentially the same thing. As you can see on the top of the pyramid, there is no code because there is just doesn't make sense. Uh, we almost debated if it makes sense to have design stuff there, but really there is no other way to describe colors than with X values or HS, HSLA or any other uh, format. So we decided to keep it. Um, what else? So another thing that we, we took as a, as a learning from this, more on the execution side, is how do you adapt this when you have teams that are moving on different speeds, right? Like I was mentioning, everybody has its own set of resources and they're different. So this is when we came up with the adoption system, um, which essentially is like a grid when you have, okay, so colors are level one, colors and spacings are level two, colors, spacings and typographies and level three, and then you define all of this. And then what you have uh, is different teams adapting to their new parent design systems at different speeds. So maybe Helio could be uh, a, an adoption level two engineering wise, an adoption level one in design wise, because we have less designers and more engineers. And on Francisco's teams, they may be more advanced because they already have a lot of designers or maybe they're just more, they're just faster. Uh, so maybe they're on design adoption level four and it's fine. Everybody moves at their own pace. You can set objectives, you can set timelines for your teams to implement this, uh, but you're not forcing everyone like, hey, if you don't meet, you, if you don't meet my, speed, my speed, then it's your problem, it's fine. Uh, you can adapt to your situation. So how does it look like when you actually put this into practice? Uh, if you remember, we just saw the other buttons and it could look something like this. So it's not longer peel button, primary button, the other name that the other one had, I already, I already forgot. I, will, I saw it two minutes ago. So uh, everybody could be a primary button. You can still have different shapes. Maybe you can, you can change that code wise or from Figma if you need someone that is a little bit bigger, um, but you're not going to allow people to have their own XA value custom made for every single button. Now it's the primary color, which leads to another question, which is, we can discuss this after the talk, but what is your primary color is also gonna be depending on your context. You can have different palettes based on when you're running your design system in which primary color may be different. Primary color, if I ask you which color should it be, it's probably gonna be yellow because you can see it everywhere. But in the context of this, in the context of the career application, you may have not seen it never before, but it's mostly green. This is why it's called primary color in this context. So uh, obviously the designers uh, did a great job here. Uh, an amazing analysis of all the colors and came up with a whole universe of colors that are acceptable in the company. Uh, it's not fully rolled out, it takes some time, uh, but essentially what we're seeing here is doesn't matter your design system, you can use whatever color you want, as long as it's one of these. It's like the old expression from Ford, like you can have any, any color for your car, as long as it's black or something like that, right? Um, so in this case, it's, it's the same. It's like, you can use any color as long as it's on this table. Can you create a new shade of green? No, you cannot, but you are free to use any of these. There has been proven to match accessibility uh, concerns, and they're also very different from each other. So you don't end up with a million different shades of green. So the benefits of this second, this, this second approach was move at your own piece. I was mentioning adoption levels, different distributions of resources per team. Uh, user first, this is what matters the most. It doesn't matter if everything is fine, if your user doesn't enjoy the experience. And uh, everyone is welcome, which is about including marketing teams, including branding content, for example, uh, as well. Um, something that was very interesting is that I never before uh, realized that this company is running in 23 different cultures or 25, I think it is. There's 25 different uh, countries. 
And even in these countries, it may be different cultures. So in this context, you may have some countries in which you assume, because you have certain culture yourself, that maybe the green color is positive and the red color is negative. In some countries, it doesn't work like that. In some countries, actually, red actually means uh, good fortune. I didn't know that about that, but now I know because that we got in contact with other teams in the company that actually know that. So this is why it's important to not just keep the conversation between designers and engineers, but actually involve as much people as you can on this process. So lastly, what the future brings us. Um, two things that I'm happy to discuss about the, the presentation if somebody wants to talk about this. Uh, too long, these topics are just too long for this presentation, but back and forth from 10, how you can use these design systems when you want to send um, backend configured UIs to the, to the, to the clients, to the, uh, either the applications or the website. And doing that with the design system is a challenge by itself because you have to use the design system from a purely server-based environment. And secondly, which is something that we're already trying out, is the full handover, automatiz automatizing the full handover of the designs to code. So we are not doing this in a magical way in which you, know, you just export components and they just work. Um, I think that many companies have tried that in the past and maybe somebody figured it out, but most of them just died in the process. Uh, so what we're trying right now is to have um, a way of synchronizing the Figma documentation that we have with the visual assets, the documentations that we have in written that we have in the website and the code. And the way we're doing this is using uh, JSONs that get shared between all of them. This is still very new, and this is why it's not part of the presentation, but I'm happy to share this afterwards if somebody has any question about it. So uh, this is it for my presentation. And Victor and I are happy to take any questions if you have any. Uh, so Victor, come along. And if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Well, my question was for the second second one uh, about the shapes of buttons. So you, <clears throat> you were saying that uh, some buttons should be bigger, some should be more professional, like rectangular, but how, how did you decide on this? Was it like some data behind this? How often does a customer click on the edges? So you say, okay, we need bigger button here, rectangular but not curved there. Okay, uh, question. I think that Francisco may know more about this since he's a designer, I'm, I'm an engineer. But yes, we do actually a lot of experiments. Uh, what I can tell you is that we use a lot of A-B test or A, B, C, D, however variants you want uh, for everything. So we do these experiments and then we just run the data to see if there's more engagement from the users of the reason. So this will be like the short version. Maybe Francisco has some other more design oriented answer to that. So as Juan explained it, like each of the different clusters evolved by the needs that each of them need have. So if we take uh, partners, they use tables and a lot of information for them. What they need probably is a bunch of buttons that fits in the small spaces. Then if you talk about couriers, they're probably in motorbike, they have a um, globe zone and then they need to click without mistaking. And then we have more, I will not say normal, but it's like more classic for the customer and it's like a more controlled environment. So there are like good practices about the minimum size of buttons that we follow, like uh, it needs to be at least 40 by 40 pixels and then playing depending of each of the cases. It's good or? <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Uh, I don't know, I'm just uh, curious about the, from your research to your 
first working prototype, how was the like the timelines and the effort involved? As in, how many different people were involved in getting to that point? Which prototype are you talking about in Globo in general? No, mm -hmm. well, from from having doing your research of um, looking at all your different design systems to getting it together. Timelines, uh, I guess. Well, I can tell you about Globo, but Globo is a huge company, so it depends on your on the company on the context that you're applying it. If it will, if you apply this into a startup scenario, you can iterate pretty fast. If you apply this in a company that has 600 engineers plus a ton of designers, then it takes months. Uh, this is how long it has taken us. So the first approach that I shared earlier, uh, the one that got destroyed by one comment. <laughs> Uh, took a month and a half of doing an, just analysis, just writing documents and doing architectural uh, overviews. Uh, and the second one, uh, which was more, much more thorough, um, that took months. That took at least four months. Okay. Uh, and then what does the, the architecture and workflow look like when uh, a change is introduced? How is that propagated? How does that work go all the way through? Okay, uh, good question. This is actually when the different layer system that we have uh, kicks in. No, um, so if you're trying to do like a, a change that is on a local level, is a local system, uh, you can make that change just by agreeing on with your rest of your teammates or maybe just you know leadership inside of your your group. Uh, but if you're trying to make something that is on a on the shared level, then you will have much more people involved. And then you have also owners of all of these code or designs that need to approve these changes. If you go all the way to the top, when you have the branding, then you will have to convince, I would guess, even the CEO of the company, because you will be changing the yellow that is everywhere. So this is how it's handled. It depends on the layer, what, you're going, what you want to change and in which layer it is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? At the technical level, like, so I am a designer or I am an engineer, so I want to change something. I'm changing Figma and then notifying the team and expecting things to happen or are things like, what, what are those arrows in, in the middle, no? in the design that, uh, that you put, if it can be asked? I think the one is for Victor, right? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so the currently the process is that it's manual. First, you have to change it in Figma, whatever the process is to agree with other designers is. Then you need to notify the owner of the component. In this case, most of the components are owned by us, like the buttons and the basic stuff. So this arrow that turns design into YAML is uh, our customer core experience team, basically, for now. Uh, this arrow will disappear soon as we have the automation. We will not need this, almost. So what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a pull request that is gonna be open automatically for engineers to review. Uh, in either way, if it's automated or not, it's an easy change. Even if you refactor the design of all these buttons at once, you change all the fonts, you completely refactor all the colors. For us, it's an easy change because we have these YAML definitions, which are actually human readable. In theory, we in the beginning, we thought that actually designers will edit them. Um, didn't happen exactly like this, but either way, it's, it's literally a few lines change. If we want to re repaint every button that you see on this tiny screenshot, it's going to be 12 files changed, maybe 10 lines in each. So in terms of effort, I don't know, it can be done in one day for sure. And, ah, and then, then next steps, sorry. <laughs> so once this changed, um, the arrow that goes to generators, it's just like a thought experiment that doesn't exist in real life because it's all automated in DCI. Once the YAML is changed, is the same monorepo, it's gonna trigger DCI to generate all of these packages. So there's gonna be no involvement of anyone once the YAML is changed. It's gonna generate all these packages, publish them into internal repositories, uh, whatever it is, GitHub package registry or whatnot for iOS. And then uh, the, we need to update it in the consumer apps. So in our case, we just do it anyways, every week or two for customer web, for example, so if this change is not very urgent, you don't need to do anything else. The YAML is changed, just wait until customer core or somebody else updates it. Or otherwise you can open the PR, just bump the version at plus one to the number. And also it's gonna be an easy change that everybody can do. And yeah, it takes, it can be all done in one day in theory. Yeah.
One more question. Uh, lots of questions. Um, so I, what you showed us there was the, 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 the demo of all the different components. Do you have the same for native? A demo app with all of the components that you yes, can review? Yes. So for native apps, we have demo apps, but I'm not going to demo them because I need to build it. It's uh, mostly done for AS developers. Uh, but if you just need to have a quick look how it's going to look like on the device, you go here, you switch to, for example, iOS, and uh, we just made a simple solution with the video. <laughs> this is actually a screen recording of this demo app I mentioned. So it's in GitHub, everybody has access, whoever is an iOS engineer can build it. Otherwise, just yeah, check the video to, to know how it looks like. And uh, is the design uh, system always uh, statically linked to the, the project or is there any dynamic loading and changes? Is the design system linked? So the design system defined in these YAML files and all these YAML files, they're kind of like themes. So we have a customer theme, but the code base supports multiple themes. So we can put another one next to it or we can edit the same one. And as we change the YAML files, yes, it updates the demo app, it updates the documentation website, it updates all the packages and yeah. Did I answer your question? Did no. I uh, please uh, tell me? <laughs> so what, what I mean uh, is in the context of applications, when they are actually installed by a customer on, on a device and you have a design change, let's yeah. say a new marketing campaign coming up, but the customer does not update the app. Yeah, it's going to be in the next update. It's going to be in the next update, yes. It's actually against App Store rules, I think, to push like the changes to the code and stuff like this without. Well, it's a kind of gray area when yeah. <laughs> we can put a web yeah. Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations. Amazing work. Uh, it's very, very impressive. And I have a question more related to the experience of working with design systems. And you, I see that you have at first five teams that were need, uh, in the need of using a design system. How was the process of evangelize the developers and the UX teams to work on these design systems? And, and yeah, I know that this platform, I, I'm sure everybody like UXers and developers are checking in, but uh, what actions did you take to democratize this, this knowledge and to, to infer the, the value of this effort that you're doing? You know? Okay, uh, so it's a very short answer really, it's just repetition. <laughs> you send a million times uh, messages to everyone uh, until they get engaged. But essentially, um, so we always were always very sharing of the documents that we were we were doing for this. So while there was somebody doing it and other people collaborating, especially on the first iterations, um, it, it, it was a public document. Anybody could check it out. And every time we were actually reaching out to some people that were uh, related with us, maybe if we're an engineer working in Android in the customer application, uh, what you should do is actually seek for your peers, which is people that have the same domain knowledge that you do and maybe can help you, you know, uh, get there. Uh, something that I will tell you is that my advice would be to avoid surprises. If you don't get people involved early, then you're gonna meet a lot of resistance when you tell them like, hey, this is the new way. And if they didn't get to say, you know, to voice their concerns in the meantime, then this is what happens. Or they tell you like, oh, this is exactly not what I wanted. And I think this is one of the key learnings of the first approach that we had. If we had been more open with it from the start, we wouldn't have wasted any, a month and a half building something that was just not compatible with other kind of users, right? So uh, evangelizing this is hard. Um, you can do all sorts of activities. So you can have like, you know, some special events that we do uh, for like trying to evangelize this. We have had hackathons in the past. We have had um, a workshops about explaining how it works. This kind of talk that we're doing right now, we have done this in the past uh, for people here in the company, because especially when the company is so, is so big, uh, people don't know that you're working on this until you really go out and reach out to them. Uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I would just say repetition, a lot of repetition. Yeah, thank you. It's happened to me. Doing, I'm doing the same thing, you know. Uh, thank you. That was
Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? No, don't you like colors? Come on. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Because I see it, well, I mean, you have different components for web, for iOS, for Android. And um, one thing that I was wondering, like, how do you decide, like, for example, because all of these different platforms, they have, for example, their native um, UI elements, but you also, as a design system, you want to be consistent. So how, what, how would you usually kind of like make the decisions like, okay, when are we going to use as much as possible the native UI elements of a platform? Or when do, I, yeah, uh, when do I decide to make something consistent with, for example, the other platforms? Yeah, this is a good question. I'm gonna pass this one to Francisco. Uh, I, I don't know that much about design myself. Um, so I will focus on a specific case, but mostly what we want is to be data informed and also bring impact to the company. If it's worth it and we will bring impact to the company and it's aligned to our brand. So it has also a brand impact. It's worth it to do it in, in, in brand. If not, we will take a native uh, solution. But we are trying always to impact with our brand in all the different uh, parts of the application. So it's more like it's worth it. We will. Um, it will have our brand, it's good, but more or less. Like, but it depends on each uh, specific case, of course. I will add that it also depends on the user journey, the thing that we were just discussing before, because maybe in one of the applications, like the customer one that I was mentioning, what we want to have there is like a differentiation between the competitors uh, and to be on the top of your mind. Maybe there it's just more worth it to go with very custom ways of doing stuff. But uh, then if you're looking for usability, it's like imagine if you wanted to go to make like a go back arrow on the web application that the partners are using for like managing their, their business, it just wouldn't make any sense. You have like the, the native back arrow from the browser, right? Uh, why would you do something like that? Um, I don't know. It really depends on the context, I guess. And, and a lot of data driven. This is something that we do a lot on the company. Like I was mentioning before, we do a lot of ABC X test and we measure that. Um, we have we have built uh, the engineering capabilities to make sure that you, we can turn these things on and off based on different audiences or just controlling this from the from the shadows to try to perform experiments. Um, and when we see that the numbers are going up and they're positive, we stick with the change. And if it doesn't, we go back and we go with another uh, variant of the experiment. Thank you. I actually have a very good example is the date picker. If a date picker, it takes three weeks of a designer, another three weeks of a developer, and then and it only gonna be used by someone in the admin panel once every six months. Is worth it to do it? Mm, probably not. So it depends of the case. Okay, any other questions? One is hungry. <laughs> there is pizza in the back. So but thank you everyone. And there is pizza and we're open to questions and just to talk. Thanks. <laughs>